on there. It's there. Yeah. Okay, I just see you. <laughs> Which is Hello me. and welcome to our three o'clock session of the Can Can Diversity Collective's Inkwell Beach Virtual Session. I am Adrienne C. Smith, the founder of the Can Can Diversity Collective, and we are honored to have this next panel sponsored by IAB, who will be giving us a full fledged story action items around allyship is step in and step up. Allies for Action. Hopefully I didn't butcher that title, but Cheryl will correct me if I'm wrong. I'm going to step in the back to listen into the great conversation. So Cheryl Goldstein, Kaylin Wilson, Jacqueline Hernandez, and Una King, take it away. Thank you so much. We are thrilled to be here. And I have to say I'm excited to be in the company of such dynamic, badass women. And you will see what I mean when you get to know these these incredible women over the next 45 minutes. Uh, I'm Cheryl Goldstein, I'm the EVP at the IAB, uh, which is the Interactive Advertising Bureau. We are the trade association for the digital media ecosystem. And I oversee all of our member engagement and I'm passionately um, overseeing our diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives. And I've invited these lovely uh, ladies here with me today to talk about how are we doing, especially in the digital media ecosystem? Um, how are we doing? Have the allies stepped in and stepped up? What does allyship mean? How have we, what, what's been working? What hasn't been working? And where do we go from here? So what I'd like to do uh, is just so that you get to know these women and the work they're doing, just start with, give each one of you a few minutes to talk a little bit about your background and your journey and what's led you to the work you're doing today. So why don't we kick it off with you, Kaylin? Um, I know you've got an uh, amazing background and I love the description on your LinkedIn. Witty, wise, worldly woman, transforming organizations via structure, inclusion, and belonging. That is a power statement. So Thank tell us you. a little bit about your background, your Verizon Media, the Disney company, and most recently at Zapier. And tell us about that and what you're doing today. Absolutely. So, hey, y'all, first of all, I'm so happy to be here, happy to, to share so much information with all of you, but also share the stage with these incredible leaders. Um, I'm Kaylin Wilson. I'm the CEO of Dream Forward Consulting, and I have been leading HR and DEI change for over a decade at uh, nonprofits, startups, uh, government agencies, as well as Fortune 100 companies. So as Cheryl was kind enough to explain, uh, I have a background leading DEI change at the Walt Disney Company and HR transformation at Verizon Media. Uh, I have led DEI at Zapier, which is a, a tech startup. And I've also worked for the city of New York and city of Chicago leading HR change and uh, working in workforce development as well when I lived in Chicago. So I've traveled all across the country. I'm on my seventh city here in Atlanta now. Um, and being able to put together like this hodgepodge of experiences has really helped to drive my mindset around inclusion, belonging, and organizational change. So you'll hear more about my thoughts and how I approach the work, but I think my LinkedIn headline kind of says it all. Witty, wise, and worldly. Um, I believe in doing this work well, but I also believe in doing it in a way uh, that brings people joy and gives people a sense of fulfillment. So I think it is possible to create all win solutions in DEI and HR. Um, and I'm happy to bring some of those insights to you all today. Fantastic. Uh, next we have Jackie Hernandez. Jackie is a passionate, seasoned exec, uh, primarily focused in the Latinx, um, Hispanic realm. Uh, she's had senior roles, uh, COO of Telemundo, CMO of Hispanic Enterprises and Content at NBCU. And now she's helping companies uh, get ready for the next new majority. So Jackie, tell us a little bit about your journey and the work that you're doing now. So first of all, it's an honor to be with these power women. And Kaylin, you have inspired me to revisit my LinkedIn uh, tag because that's just fabulous. Cheryl, thanks for having me. Um, you know, as you mentioned, my career has been in media and it's primarily been in two big media companies, Warner Media and NBC Universal, but working across a number of many different brands and multiple platforms. 
Um, you know, it, it's been a career that in, in, at the end of my years at NBC Universal, I was working across the full portfolio, helping them first to reach Hispanic Latinx consumers and then really broadening that to reach multicultural Generation Z and millennial consumers. And it's what led me to where I am today. Um, two years ago, my business partner and I launched our company, New Majority Ready, and it's a marketing and strategy consulting firm that really works with businesses to help them embrace the cultural and demographic changes that have already happened. I mean, right now, almost half of America is ethnically and racially diverse. And if you look at 18 and under, it's 52%. I mean, this is this is now and it's happening. And so we're excited to be a part of helping businesses really see this huge opportunity in front of them. Yeah, it's like what was multicultural, it's now becoming gen market. You know, so yeah. it's flipped on its on its side. Okay, next we have Una King, who's got a fascinating story. Uh, she was a baroness. She was in the House of Lords, the second black woman elected to parliament, a senior advisor of the prime minister. She's worked uh, in doing diversity work at Google and YouTube. And I think the most interesting successful part of her story is she has four kids. Like, wow, how do, how do you do it all, Una? Tell us a little bit about your fascinating uh, story. Well, I have to say, I'm the only mother I know of four kids who never gave birth. Okay, so I don't want to make people think I'm like those women that can just pop them out. I definitely am not. In fact, it's probably because full transparency that I was infertile and wanted kids so much that I ended up getting bloody four of them. And I really don't, I don't recommend that if you want to be strategically on it, on it, on it in your career. But that's not the only thing in life, right? Um, so yeah, I have three adopted kids. And then the last, the, the youngest one who's seven, and I'm 53. So frankly, I am too old for this shit. But anyway, um, yeah, the, <laughs> the youngest one, he is our biological child via surrogacy. So that was TMI. TMI, wasn't it? Probably a little bit too much information. Um, but I am a recovering politician. Um, I spent 20 years uh, in the UK Parliament. Um, first in the House of Commons as a member of Parliament and then as a member of the House of Lords. Um, I, I know a bit about privilege um, in terms of the House of Lords. I, it was an appointment. People go, oh, you're a baroness. That means what? You come from a rich family. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, I'm the most street person that probably ended up in the House of Lords. Anyway, um, a feudal privilege, it's an appointment for life. Um, and that kind of thing should be changed, shouldn't it? But in the meantime, uh, yeah, I'm on a leave of absence from the House of Lords in uh, the tech industry in the US, spent uh, three years in Silicon Valley, uh, now head up DEI at Snap, and really interested in how we drive systemic change. Like, and sorry, I've spent, you know, 20, actually, depending how you define my work, probably 30 years um, doing this work. And I've really, really focused on systemic change. And what I've learned in the last year and since the murder of George Floyd is that you can't change the systems and think that's gonna work without changing how people within the systems fundamentally think internally inside their minds. And that is the culture change. We gotta we gotta step up to do that. You can't just do systems alone. That's so maybe that's a good place to kick off uh, the conversation. So in the work that you're doing, how do you help people change the way they look at and think about things? Because we're we're talking here about allyship, but can you really step in and step up? if you don't start by opening up your mind and looking at things from a different lens. How do you help people do that? Let's start with you. Yeah, I, I, I don't think you can uh, solve the problem unless you understand it requires internal reflection. And I, you know, I'm someone, I wanna get things done quickly. If you'd said this to me like 10 years ago, I'm like, internal reflection, what the hell are you talking about, right? But frankly, that's what's gonna have to happen. I was challenged by my CEO at Snap. He said, you know, what are the three things that everyone at Snap should know they have to do on DEI? And you know, a lot of us in DEI is like, oh, let me give you a to-do list. Three things, we'll tick off systemic racism by lunchtime. You know, that's not gonna happen. But he was right that you need to give people something they can get a hold of and that they can that they're not overwhelmed. You know, it can be so overwhelming. How are you going to change 400 year legacy, etc. Um, and so what we did was we came up with this thing called the three eyes. When you want to ask what should I do? There are three eyes. First is internal. Do the work 
to understand what allyship means, how do you spot inequity, and how do you use your position in the majority group, we're all in majority groups sometimes, and in and not other times, how do you use that position to change inequity? That is the first I. Second I, once you've got a handle on that, interpersonal. How are you gonna change behavior? And that's the lived experience that people on the other side are dealing with as underrepresented groups every day of the week, every hour of the day. And then thirdly, when you got those two, internal to personal institution, then how are you gonna change the system? So that's how we're trying to think about it at SNAP. Love that. How about Kaylin? You work a lot with executives on how to change culture and what are some of the things that you're seeing and how do you help at the top, because I believe it has to start at the top. If your senior executives don't yes. take it seriously and are committed, then it doesn't permeate the culture. So what are some of the things that you're doing with executives to help change culture? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, I had to snap Una up earlier because I was like, yes, 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 say it. Um, you know, I think the idea of it starting internally is super important, but it's about what you reflect on internally. So when I'm working with executives, a key part of that is executive coaching because I want to be a safe space for CEOs and other executives to land, to have conversations about things that they honestly may not have another place to even share, right? Because of course we have an image of leaders and CEOs and especially um, in the media space where you have to be put together and you have to know the answer and you're on the minute you step in front of a group. So I get to be the place where they can be off and they can be confused and they can be scared and nervous and feel all of those emotions and talk through things. And so with that, it's about challenging, what have you come to know about yourself? One of the things that I work with in one of the training programs I've created called Five Hour for Business Leaders is that we have 52 dimensions of our identity. 52 pieces of us are happening simultaneously at all times. And at any given moment, one part of our identity could be speaking louder than the other. Our circumstances could be requiring a part of us to stand out. So for example, you know, Una brought up about being a mom, but people who are listening and watching this are like, yeah, but I want to hear about you being a black woman, right? And so the demands on these pieces of our identity cause us to show up in different ways. And so again, just giving people that safe space to talk through what does it mean to be able to say, hey, I'm a woman, but I'm a white woman. And so I really don't understand when people say the, uh, when people talk about the struggles of black trans women who disproportionately face um, all kinds of violence, right? And those numbers have been escalating over the past couple of years. So again, focusing on what it is that you're reflecting on is gonna be important. And then the second part to that is taking that reflection and putting real action items to it. So for example, if you recognize, you know what, okay, I have a, a particular view on race, but I don't understand how class or socioeconomic status fits into that. Making an action plan to say, hey, I wanna learn. That's a point of curiosity, right? Where I, I wanna understand more about the ways in which socioeconomic status impact the way someone has a, an experience with race. And then take that natural curiosity and take actions to learn, to grow, to have conversations, to expand your own thinking. Kaylin, I think that's an excellent point. When we talk, yeah, snaps, snaps. <laughs> that's the international signal for, uh, for this session. But, you know, what I see out there when it comes to allyship, people don't always know where to begin. It's like, well, what yes. can I do? Or they expect their company to do something. And it's like, and the company is like, well, we're not sure as a company, what can we do? But as right. individuals, a simple step is listen to the voices. Listen yeah. to podcast, listen to watch some of the content. You know, if you put yourselves into their space and yeah. listen to the stories that are being told by black women, Latino women, um, you know, immigrants coming over, what it's like for them to cross yes. the, the journey, the struggles, what it took for them to get here. Your whole mindset about immigration is going to be changed, altered, yeah. put yourself yeah. in their shoes and understand what they're risking and what they left behind exactly. and why behind the what. Exactly. And I, that's the empathy piece that if we just started there, we would already have huge progress because then you can really yeah. find a way to relate. Jackie, it's, what are you saying? It's really, you know, oh, you ahead, Jackie, sorry. That I think that Ally Shep starts with listening, learning, reflecting and then empathizing and, and and then going back again. It's it's an ongoing process. 
someone once defined it as a lifelong process. This is not just you go and do it and you're, you got it. No, this is ongoing. And, and it's interesting because I think there's a really big opportunity for media, for the media industry. Because you know, what is media? We, we are communicators. We're storytellers. And to be able to get these stories out there and share them and have people have the conversation, the real conversations, the tough conversations, the uncomfortable conversations, that's what's going to help us all to be able to understand. And I think that for individuals and for companies, it's to encourage cultural curiosity, which is to also encourage and open the door to diversity where everyone feels welcome and every voice feels that they have a voice at the table table and be able to be themselves. And so driving culture is all around this whole notion that you mentioned, Cheryl, about listening and learning. Yeah. So, I love that. I want to hop in on that real quick, because okay. when you think about media as storytellers, we are not we are telling the stories of real people and real lived experiences, even when it is a fictional story. And I think sometimes that gets lost. So many conversations have come up, particularly in the last year since George, George Floyd was murdered, around who gets to control a narrative and who is centered in a narrative, right? So when we talk about something being white-centered or male-centered or affluent-centered or if something is considered ableist, right, and it's not mm -hmm. centering the voices of people with visible or invisible disabilities, it doesn't mean that people are not present. Right. You could have an Asian person in a commercial and not center an Asian voice or the Asian or an, an Asian narrative that is true to that particular you know, culture and subculture within that, because that's a large umbrella, too. Right. So yep. when we talk about storytelling, the authenticity in storytelling comes from who wrote the story, who had a chance to control the direction of the story, who languaged the story, and then who gets to give feedback that is then taken seriously about the story. And I think that that is a key place where media uh, could make a significant shift because we're all influenced by media, whether it's commercials, TV shows, movies, right? If we think about what we came to know about relationships or parenthood or what it meant to work, we probably got that from some movie or TV show when we were a kid, right? Yeah. So again, real people are at the center of this. And when we allow people to speak authentically, right? When we allow uh, images of black women that don't always involve the strong black woman trope or the mammy trope, right? Or uh, the, the single black woman trope, right? Where we get to see dark skinned black women. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, me as a darker skinned black woman, right? I love when I get a chance to see women who are married, women who are happily with their children, women who are happily engaging with their mothers, right? To some people, they don't think of that, but those are very real tropes that have impacted our experience of not seeing us in loving relationships or being able to be, you know, quote unquote, soft or stereotypically feminine. There's an impact of that. And so again, as media professionals, you always have the opportunity to sit back and ask yourself again, who is centered in this narrative and whose perspective is centered, who got a chance to write the narrative and whose feedback will we be willing to take seriously and not just see it as like a noisy, you know, ball horn or something like that in our ear. Sure. Well, thank you. Can I have something? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll go ahead. Go ahead. No, Cheryl's never going to get a word in again, is she? No, no, you go first, Jacqueline, and then I'll hop on. Okay, I promise it's very quick. It's just, um, go ahead. Just go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> it's an opportunity for media, but it's even, it's a necessity for businesses that want to grow. The consumer wants to see the real world. They want to see that authenticity. So I will turn it back to you, but I just wanted to make that. For ours, we're talking just about this, you know, about how, you know, they are seeing, you know, they're with black agencies and black media companies and yet, the writers that get assigned to work or the photographer or whatever, you know, isn't white. So they put a black actor, but, you know, have a white crew working on it or writing it. And it's like, what's up with that? Right. So that whole panel before us, that's what they were talking about. So I couldn't agree more, but oh, Una, go ahead. You were going to say something. I, yeah, I just wanted to add on this point, um, Kaylin's point about storytelling. I mean, I guess, you know, we all <laughs> um, are really aware of the power uh, of storytelling, obviously, in this industry, um, in different forms and formats, I should say. I mean, you know, Snap came up with a different type of story, <laughs> but it's still always about uh, storytelling. What I wanted to say is slightly tangential, but core to how you change 
power structures within the companies that are creating the platforms and the stories and the narratives, right? And it's this experience we had at Snap, which I, I'm sure you may have had similar experiences, but in the, in the wake of George Floyd's murder, what happened was the executives and our C-suite who, I mean, I have to say, it's why I came to Snap because I, I genuinely, I mean, look, I'm not gonna get a public, a public event and go, oh, my C-suite are rubbish. I swear to God, genuinely, I came to Snap because I was inspired by the leadership team. Having said that, they understood racism, in my view, in my view, most of them, not perhaps the black C-suite exec, but most of them who are not black, understood racism intellectually. They understood it was a terrible thing. They understood they wanted to change the world, but they were not actually taking the deep systemic steps that would change. What changed that? It was a very profound two-hour meeting. It was scheduled to be a one-hour meeting, a two-hour meeting with our black ERG, and our black SNAP members told their real, true, authentic stories of living while black. And my C-suite, literally, their, their understanding was transformed. Why was it transformed? Because actually, they left the intellectual side behind and they got proximate. They got proximate and they realized, I mean, like real thing. Like I remember one of them saying, sorry, my seven-year-old is staring at me. Darling, I can't speak right now. If the, if the kids I'm bust staring. in, I apologize. Um, you know, like one of them saying, hey, um, my 17-year-old just got a driver's license. Um, and, you know, there was a, a, a black woman that's not saying, yeah, my 17-year-old just got a driver's license. I can't let him use that car. And one of my the executives had a 17-year-old and they just it'd been the most joyous experience oh you've just got a car and she said wow it just never occurred to me that your whole life is impacted by things i never thought about and mm -hmm. and that's just a tiny example and my point is though it then and this is the really important thing it was then translated into very powerful business OKRs, you know, objectives and key results, right? It's this thing, you cannot have a diversity strategy or, oh, let's be nice to underrepresented groups. First of all, it's not charity. It's because you want to make your business stronger. But second of all, when you actually do that properly, you you have to connect it to your business strategy. It's yeah. not your separate DEI plan. It is your business strategy. It's that flip that you were talking about. It's not multicultural marketing. It's marketing in a multicultural world. So you yeah. don't want to be left behind. You better make that change. You better get more proximate. You better start understanding the lived experience. It's not. It's not like a like this kind of optional extra. Certainly not for the underrepresented groups, right? And and majority groups have to start understanding that. And that is what allyship is. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Well, how are we? I love that. I love that. Is is an ex, is an extraordinary company, and I have to say, they are our founding partner for the Inclusion Institute um, at the IAB. They stepped in, stepped up right away. Just when we said we need to do something, they're like, "How can we help?" So I've I've experienced firsthand uh, the commitment that they've made, but I don't see that as a pervasive thing. What I see is a lot of companies. Treating DEI is a kind of nice to have or maybe a must have, but the way they go about it, it's like the one person of color or you know, someone who says, hey, what are we doing about DEI? Oh, good, you can lead it. And, you know, And it's someone who doesn't have the right training, the right background, nor do they necessarily want the job, but it's like, okay, here, you'll show us what we need to do. And I think that's so misguided to expect the people who are the ones that are kind of the, subjects that are being you know left behind to be the ones to fix the problem so like how do we change that thinking and that dynamic how do we get Kaylin? you work a lot with the c's to me jackie you too what are yeah. you already talked about what they're doing at snap what are the things you're actually doing to help companies change that dynamic and that thinking yeah you know i think i was actually just talking about this in a forbes article that one of the first things that a company should decide is whether or not they want to be a pioneer, follow the status quo, or be invisible in this work. And that's different for each functional area, but that is a critical decision. And you know, this is a no judgment zone because sometimes it could be resource constraints, sometimes it could be time constraints, sometimes it could be that the company knows that they can't have the longevity in the work, but you have to decide, am I gonna be a pioneer in marketing but follow the status quo in hiring right now? Do I wanna be a pioneer 
in the way we approach, you know, philanthropic, uh, you know, activities and maybe perhaps also be a pioneer in the way we approach our product development and thinking about inclusion around accessibility. So those decisions can really drive so many decisions and help them to split up the budget in a way that makes sense and that you can then make transparent to the organization so people can know why you're doing it. Because other than that, you're going to have knee jerk reactions dependent on external events. And when it's not an iterative strategy, you cannot respond appropriately because then it ends up being tit for tat among marginalized employees and customers. So, OK, you gave five million to black people when George Floyd was murdered, but you only gave two million when there was the Asian hate crime and the people were murdered at the spa in Atlanta. Why is that? Right. Whenever those types of conversations come up. You know, that to me says there's no strategy around this. And so how can companies be proactive in thinking about, hey, what is our market share here? Where do we want to go next? Who is involved in that community? Where are we building a new office and what's the demographic makeup of that community? Has there been gentrification? OK, great. Now we're going to take that data and then make decisions about how we want to do marketing, how we want to do our advertising and how we want to even uh, recruit people from within that community or from uh, that particular demographic. Those questions are critical and they happen before you take any action. But when yeah. you don't have the right DEI staff in place who know how to set up that strategy or make those types of uh, or gather those types of insights, then you're already starting at a disadvantage. And so, again, that question about pioneering versus just kind of status quo versus being invisible. You know, you have to answer that up front. Everybody can't be a Ben and Jerry's, but everybody else, you know, you don't also have to be the person who we can't even name you because we don't know what you're doing in DEI. Right. There is a spectrum of activity that an, a company could potentially show up in and then grow over time. I think also um, to everything you said, and just to add to that, you know, diversity cannot live within diversity. And Cheryl, I think you mentioned this. It, what I mean by that, it's not a function, it's not a person, it's not a team. It has to be lived by everyone in the company from the top down. And there can be a team that's working on it, but diversity is a mind frame that an inclusion is a mind frame and equity is a mind frame. And so I think it, it from the top, from all the leaders across the company, it's interesting, a few years ago, the CEO of Nielsen, David Kinney, ended up um, announcing that he was going to add CDO to his title. And it was because he was making diversity a, a, a big priority for the company. Something else is transparency. Everything that you do, you should be transparent about. At the beginning of the year, Netflix came out with an inclusion report. And it was great. It looked at um, you know, diversity across every department, in front of the camera, behind the camera, but it also looked at equal pay and it looked at inclusiveness and, and, and it highlighted areas that they needed to do better in. And so that is, that is key. And then the, the final one is, you know, taking this from not just the right thing to do, but also the, the thing to do, the business thing to do. And, and it, that is the only way you're going to be able to grow. And we've seen some things in our own industry, um, just recently in the upfronts and Disney announced that they were going to call advertisers up and ask them, not ask them, say that they needed to have multicultural marketing in their upfront deals. And just a couple of days ago, some of the biggest holding companies, um, Group M, some huge national advertisers said they are going to commit to at least two to 10 percent, you know, Barry's um, on black owned media and, and media publishers, minority owned publishers. These are big steps, you know, and, and I also think it's leadership within one of one of our clients, Spectrum Reach, rolled out a whole multi platform, um, multicultural initiative this year with ad solutions. It was driven by the leaders, Michael Guth and Shell Aragon. And inside, they are advocates because they they believe and they are helping have the conversations across the company, looking at product and services, how to go to market and everything else. Yeah, the, uh, the, the commitment to spend on minority owned entities has come up a lot at the IAB. You know, many of our members have said, I've heard multiple discussions around it. Some are, how do we find, how do we vet, who decides what minority owned even means? Does it have to be 50% or greater? What, what really is the criteria and what is it that brands are really looking for? Is it to support a minority owned entity or is it to support the voices? Because not every minority owned property is aimed at a minority audience. And then you're going to have, then I've heard from some of our bigger publishers like, hey, we've hired 
black writers, creators put a huge investment into creating an opportunity for their voices to be seen and heard, our brand's gonna get behind that too, just because it's not minority owned. So I'm actually leading a whole initiative um, through the IAB to get consensus across the industry on what exactly do we mean by minority owned? What is the intent of those dollars? How do we help sites get ready for those ad dollars? Because that's another problem. You've got all these minority or small properties that don't have the right ad units. They don't have all the things that, you know, the bigger media companies know brands need and want, the reporting, and, and they're not ready for programmatic spend. So even while the dollars and intent is there, it's chaos in terms of how that money gets spent, where it gets spent, and making sure that they're legitimately, legitimately spending on the properties that are truly minority owned that would benefit from those dollars in the way the brands intend. So it's it's a big honking you know mess right now, but we are committed to try and help drive some consistency around that. Um, are you seeing anything like that? Am I saying stuff that makes sense to you? A little bit. You of know, it's, it's interesting. I want to hop in on that real quick because this idea, what you just named about all the pieces of like Una said earlier, the system, right, which people drive when you're able to address each part of the system in a particular sequence, that's when you drive systemic change. When you do things out of sequence, right? So for example, oh, we're gonna give money over here, right? But that doesn't change the policies. Oh, we're gonna change the policy, right? But people don't have the resources, right? So there are all these things that have to happen. And one of the things I remember, this was a conversation um, at Disney around the time um, when I was transitioning to another role was to think about, Oh, we set up this system at one point and it worked then, but now we're realizing that perhaps this system is not the most effective now. So now what can we do again in sequence to be able to make this a more equitable experience? And I think as organizations and leaders within an organization challenge themselves in that way, they can really drive that change because again, there's always a little loophole somewhere, some little corner that if you don't address that part, it'll blow up the whole thing that you're trying to change. Yeah. So you've got to have these properties ready and able to take the money, you know? So like we're saying, we need to have a little toolkit and some webinars and help them know what they need to do to be at the ready to receive some of those dollars and how do we vet them? You know, so there's all of that. And then, um, you know, again, I see a lot of, we're going to do this and then the how to get it done and how to be accountable. Like I want to be able at the end of the year, go back and say, did you really spend 2% of your budget here? Show us where and how, what properties benefited from that? Where were they and where are they today because of your commitment? I would love to see some way to hold them accountable to this because it's easy to say, count us in. And then, mm, okay, but how, would, how do we really know? So tell me a little bit about some positive successes that you've seen. And then I want to talk a little bit about failures, but let's talk a little bit what are some companies doing right? We've hit on a few things. Sounds like Snap got a couple things right. What else are you seeing that's actually been a, made a difference this past year? I mean, we also got many things wrong and we did also put that in our diversity annual report because like Netflix, which I thought had a great diversity annual report as well, um, you know, if you're not gonna be real about not just what is working, but what isn't, because still, the and I'll tell you what isn't working. What isn't working, if you want to get, and I know we're talking, we, we've got so many industries here. We've got the tech industry, we've got the media industry. Um, but, you know, if it's fundamentally, as an example, if you want to get more women and people of color um, from underrepresented groups into the tech industry, um, for example, uh, you've got to have some systems thinking. You can't just run around like graduates and think you will ever significantly shift the underlying problem. The like as an example, this is one example. There'll be different examples in the media industry. You know, to decide if you get into computer science, you can only get on that track if you've done eighth grade and ninth grade algebra. We did an analysis of Atlanta public schools: eight schools where black kids go, three schools where white kids go. Like, and they looked at the middle schools and provision of of algebra. A lot of the schools where black kids were did not even offer eighth grade algebra. The ones where they did, the white kids were getting a, in a school that was better resourced, were getting 98% pass rates, 99% pass rates for the white girls, 97% pass rates for the white boys. 
for the black kids, the pass rate, and this is this is eighth grade algebra, was five percent. Don't tell me tech companies are going to worry about like twenty-two-year-old black kids locked out of tech. It's eighth graders being locked out. And the other thing is, it's not one company that's going to fix that problem. Um, and you know, Cheryl, what you were talking about also with accountability, it is about putting those systems of accountability in place at an industry level so that you have some industry standards that can drive things up instead of a race to the bottom. Um, and so, you know, that's one thing we're doing at the moment. Um, I won't bore you with it too much. Uh, it's not being launched until the end of September, beginning of October. But it, what it seeks to do in the tech industry, and I think every single industry needs to do this, is to get an accountability mechanism in place. We're calling it uh, the Tech Equity Accountability Mechanism Team, because it's a team effort as well. You know, it's just not, you can't think you're gonna succeed just in your own little space. It, it is the, the, the barriers, the systemic barriers to, black kids and Hispanic kids and girls, the stereotypes that are being pushed on them from, uh, you know, uh, there's research showing that girls decide they're not interested in STEM subjects at the age of six. Wow. So what what are we gonna do <laughs> to address um, that? And and the last thing I wanted to say, it's not strictly related, but um, uh, I, Kaylin, if I nodded any more at what you were saying, my head would probably fall off. Um, but, you know, I, I wanted to elevate this one point about, um, you mentioned dark skinned. Like there are so many layers within layers within layers, kind of like literally and metaphorically, or I should say shades and shadism. I know, for example, I only became a member of parliament because I had one white parent. There is no way in hell I would have been elected if I had two black parents, right? Now, that like mixed race people understand that, black people understand that. I don't necessarily think necessarily that white people understand shadism and how um, crippling it is to opportunity. Uh, and, and it happens in, in Asia, it is rampant. In Africa, it is rampant. And in America and Europe, it is rampant. Um, and, you know, we, we need to be thinking about the stories, about the narratives, about the narratives that we're, that we're putting forward um, and having some standards uh, and w what is best practice here? And the toolboxes that you were talking about. So yeah, I sorry, I, I know that was a bit of a separate point. I just couldn't help but uh, come back to it. I also think, you know, personally, do you think Barack Obama would ever been elected if he'd had two <laughs> black parents? There, there's just so many, there are so many barriers. And if you help one black person's experience, you know, get across that barrier, you have to remember that there's a whole system out there keeping a whole other multitude of experiences back. So yeah, I just wanted to raise a couple of those points. I love that. I have to hop in on this because the exact experience that Ona just named is my actual lived experience. So I happened to be really smart at like five. And so my teachers at my school, because my parents, I grew up fairly poor, so they didn't know anything about magnet schools and all that stuff. And so they got me into this magnet school. I call it college prep elementary school. So I got to take algebra in sixth grade and pre-calc and go to Northwestern for some programs. I'm a native Detroiter, Detroit stand up. And, you know, all of the things, right, that had to happen at five and six and then 12 and 16 to, you know, go to Michigan and graduate. And then all those things, right, had any one little ball dropped, right, my entire experience would be different because my biological brother, we grew up same family, totally different experiences. And so I've dedicated my academic career in adulthood to studying black men at work and their experiences and what happens to them. What happens to them in high school when there is no investment? So I looked at Chicago public schools. What happens to them when they make it to the workforce and how they're shut out of opportunities and are underdeveloped? What happens to them when they're an entrepreneur and they're shut out of opportunities? I did research in Ghana and South Africa on that. So, you know, there are all of these elements that happen at strategic points in time. And so when you think, I want to bring it back <laughs> on topic, when we think about what does it mean to be in advertising, to be in a digital media space and influence, the storytelling, what are we sharing with children? What are we showing with children? What are we showing to children about what's possible for them? What are we showing uh, to and partnering with schools to make possible for them? How are we influencing and spending money to invest in STEM programs for kids, to invest in programs? You know, I, I made an example um, at one of my clients, which is a tech startup. I was like, hey, everybody is not going to be a, an engineer, but somebody could be a marketing executive. Somebody could be an HR executive. So a part of this conversation is to show kids 
all of the skills that they need to build and the, to develop the curiosity to know so much is possible for you. You know, when you give kids access to that, they can be anything they want. And like I said, I'm living proof of that because I had the experiences of companies coming to my school and talking to us. And I was like, oh, oh, I could go work and do that. Duh, of course I would. It's those conversations and that plants the seed that we then grow into an expectation as adults. And then people can advocate for themselves and know that their voice matters just as much as someone else's. Jackie, I feel like you're oh, you're on mute. You're on mute. Sorry, sorry. But, you know, it, it's, there's so well, quickly just one thing on what Una said. You you mentioned regions. I would just add Latin America to that. There's a whole thing there. Oh my God, you're um, so but right. because you're we so lot, right, you're so one of my adopted children <laughs> is front is half Brazilian. Oh my God, the shade is and yeah. yeah. Oh my God, but hey, that's another webinar, yeah, isn't it? And then to, to also take the other point, you both mentioned companies that go out and get in the community. And it, what's very interesting is you'll find a direct correlation between the ones that do that and then end up having much more diversity. And it's because their emotional intelligence is awakened when they see this. And I'm going to give you a quick, very recent example. Comcast, as part of Internet Essentials, during the pandemic went into markets that kids that didn't have uh, Wi-Fi connections at home and did live zones so that they could be able to have access. Just yesterday, they came out with their annual impact report. 44% of their employees are people of color. So I'll just leave it on that note. It's representative of the world that well, we live so in. So we only have a couple minutes left. And what I'd like to do is a quick around the horn, um, something that people are Companies should stop doing something they should start doing. To give you guys a couple seconds to think about it, I'll start. I would like to see companies stop hiring based on experience and start hiring based on potential. What I see is saying, I'm looking for someone who's, and it's so specific, you know, I want, they want someone who's done the job already. And if you keep looking for people that have done the job already and I need them to hit the ground running now, what you're saying is you're not willing to invest. You're not willing to take someone who has a lot of potential, work with them, teach them the business, and then bring more diversity into your organization. What you want is I want to hit the ground running. So that's going to leave the role to like five people who are qualified. And I probably would bet that none of them present any kind of diversity. So I'd like to see that change. Stop doing that. Start hiring based on potential. Kaylin, stop, start. What What do you say? Absolutely. I'd like for companies to start doing job analyses. So really breaking down what is actually required in the current iteration of their jobs so that they can be clear about what is actually a required skill versus a preferred skill. And I'd love for them to stop assuming that they can only do a little bit because I think the companies have way more capacity to really uh, push this work forward than they actually believe. Una? Yeah, I would love companies to stop saying, oh, the diverse talent isn't there. It's just not there. It's always there. You just haven't looked long enough and you haven't looked hard enough. You haven't looked in adjacent talent pools. You haven't turned your hiring and recruitment into competency based, uh, you know, instead of asking that you come from a top 10 school, et cetera. The talent is there. I'd love to see them start doing batch hiring. All the data shows that when you hire in batches, you get far more diversity than when you hire one at a time. Jackie, you get the last word. I see we're getting booted. Uh, I, I'd like companies and people to make diversity, their business mantra, and then be able to show the incredible results that they're going to have because they will. Okay. What a great session. Thank you for having us. Yes, this was an amazing session, ladies. Thank you so much. The chat was going wild and they were saying amen and giving all the snaps that you could ever want. Um, I could have thought we were at a poetry session with all the snaps that were happening. So thank you so much for the jewels that you dropped. Um, we definitely invite you to join us in Martha's Vineyard this summer, August 10th through the 12th, um, where we are taking the can experience to the actual original Inkwell Beach in Martha's Vineyard. So we would love to have you there. Sherry, Una, Jacqueline, Kaylin, thank you so much for the support. And we hope to see you soon. We want everybody else to stay. We have a three o'clock session, which is called Don't Watch the Rainbow. 
It is our last session, and we think it's going to be incredible with some great speakers. Um, so please join us then. This is our last day. I cannot believe it. Two, three days of great programming, um, but there's so much more to come. Thank you so much, and we will see you all at the Thank you for having us. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. It's been fun. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.